All right. So when Glenn uh, asked me or if I wanted to teach this Sunday, last Sunday, so he, he doesn't give a whole lot of notice. <laughs> and so I get to, to thinking and praying about, okay, what am I going to teach on? And um, the Lord took me to Acts chapter 17. And if you know anything about Acts chapter 17, it's kind of a long chapter, and it's all about Paul and some of his difficulties that he's having. And I'm thinking, hey, okay, Lord, I know there's a sermon in there somewhere, but I'm not seeing it. And so it wasn't until after much thought and prayer that the Lord finally reveal to me where it was that he he wanted or at least where I think he wanted to go so this morning our our topic is going to be on religious freedom is it a right or is it a gift but before we get into that let's talk a little bit of of history so you're going to get a little bit of a history lesson and then we're going to tie it all together in uh, a little bit later on so in the 1500s and the early 1600s, a group of politically active English Bible Christians were on the rise. Uh, this group was known as the Puritans. They began to make their mark on the English uh, church and in England in the 1500s, but then really kind of came onto the scene in the early 1600s, that first decade of the 1600s on into about the 1630s. Now, the, the Puritans were Christians who believed that the Church of England was too much like the Roman Catholic Church. If you know anything about the Church of England at all, England was Catholic up until the time of the Reformation, in the, fifth, in the 1530s, 1534. And so in 1534, during the Reformation, they reformed and they became their own Church of England. Um, so this group of Puritans who believed that the Church of England was too much like the, the Roman Catholic Church, they wanted to purify the Church of the liturgy and the ceremony, or practices that were not actually found in Scripture. Now, these Puritans believed that they could change the Church of England from inside, from within the church. Uh, to the Puritans, the Bible was their sole authority, and they applied it to every area of their lives. Puritans believed that it was necessary to be in a covenant relationship with God in order to be redeemed from our sinful condition. Uh, and that God had chosen to reveal salvation through preaching and that the Holy Spirit was the energizing instrument of salvation. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, it does to me. Sounds like they're pretty on point. They really evolved in the Calvinist way. And I don't want to go into a whole, you know, uh, dissertation about Calvinism or anything like, like that, but Calvinism was their major influence in their teachings. It's what, they, it's what caused them or led them to break away then from the Catholic Church. Now, in the early 1600s, as the Puritans were becoming notorious in England uh, for their stance against the Church of England, many of them began to leave England to escape the ridicule and the persecution that was prevalent there. The aim of these Puritan escapists was to try to establish a biblical community, a holy commonwealth, if you will, as an example to England and to the world as to what the Church of England should be. So by the 1620s, the Puritans were on their way to colonizing areas in and around what we now know as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So there were small colonies that had, had started there in and around Cape Cod and in and around um, the Boston area and further south. Now, I have always grown up, as I'm sure you have too, thinking that 
The pilgrims were the ones who left England to escape the tyranny and the persecution. And that they came over and they landed at Plymouth Rock, right? Not what we were taught? I mean, that's the way I remember it. And yes, they did. But the pilgrims actually come a little bit later than, than some of the Puritans. A lot of the Puritan colonies had already started here before the pilgrims ever arrived. They are the ones, though, who you grow up learning about and hearing about as having started most of the colonies. And, of course, they're the ones that gave us Thanksgiving, right? Of course they did. You know, you can't have a pilgrim without a Thanksgiving, thinking of Thanksgiving, right? So, it, pilgrims, in the, they came from the same background. They came out of the church in England after the Reformation in 1534, because then, in the Church of England, every citizen was a member of the church. And you could not be part of government. You could not be even a, a local leader of any kind if you were not a member of the Church of England. So these pilgrims, these that, that we know them now as pilgrims, is a group of farmers from northern England. They became disparaging sparingly, whatever, you know what I'm saying, and known as separatists. So they began, instead of the, like the Puritans, where they were trying to change the church from within, these pilgrims, these separatists, actually left the Church of England and began to meet in secret in their own homes and in small buildings within their communities. They were religious nonconformist. They were rebels. <laughs> they were also, like the, the Puritanists, they were Calvinists. And they disliked the whole hierarchy of the Church of England. Because one of the reasons the Church of England separated from the Roman Catholic Church is because they didn't like that the Roman Catholic Church was run by the Pope. So they separate, they become the Church of England, and then the King of England says, hey, I'm the head of the Church of England. So they got the same thing. So these separatists, that's what they were leaving. That's what they were trying to uh, get away from. They were seeking a more democratic and direct religious experience. Now, they had decided that the only way that they could be true to their own conscience was to separate themselves from the established Church of England and then go and worship in secret. And so as they started to meet together in secret, you know, nothing ever really stays a secret. So the word gets out, the church elders, the church leadership says, take them out. And so they went and they started seizing their lands and they started persecuting them and prosecuting them. Some of them were thrown in jail. A lot of them lost uh, land that had been in their families for centuries. So in 1608, a congregation of these separatists from a small town called Scrooby, like scrooby doo we doo in the English countryside, decided that they were going to leave England and relocate. Where were they going to relocate to? Where? Holland. Holland, exactly. You get a bonus gold star, Paul. <laughs> so they spent the first couple of years after they left the Church of England in Amsterdam, but because they didn't really fit in amongst the people, amongst the Dutch. The Dutch were far more liberal in the things that they were uh, uh, doing and the things that they allowed. Um, the, this small group of separatists from Scrooby was worried about their teenagers because they're, in Amsterdam, the teenagers were beginning to become corrupted 
And so they then said, okay, well, we've got to get out of here. They moved to a small town called Leiden. And I know you can't see it, but it is where that square is. Amsterdam is all the way up at the top. And then they moved down to this small area called Leiden. While they were there, they remained there for 10 years. And they set up a community church, or community churches. And they were able to worship in the way and in the fashion that they felt like they should be able to. The problem was there was just no economic opportunities there for them. They were poor, and a lot of them were starving. It was difficult because of that economic uh, condition to get anybody else from England to come over and join them. Nobody wants to move to an economically depressed area, um, especially if you're coming from one that in, is enjoying success. So they heard about this place called the New World, and they decided that that's where they were going to go. So they packed up what they could, and they boarded a ship called the Speedwell. And they sailed on the Speedwell all the way to England. They went back where they started from. While they were there in England for a short period, they signed a contract with the Virginia Trading Company. Now, that was a trading company that was chartered by uh, King James I. And yes, it's the same King James that commissioned the Bible that, that a lot of you use. Um, so they, he was allowing people to go to the New World and to colonize, set up local governments, still under the, the control of the church and, the, and, and England, but you could have more localized government that, that controlled your, your local stuff. So uh, this, this, the separatists felt was going to work out great for them because they could go and establish their own colony, their own community where they could worship in the way that they, that they wanted to. So on September 6th of 1620, they boarded the Speedwell and the Mayflower and they left England for Virginia. Now shortly after they got out the Speedwell started taking, taking on water and had to turn around and go slowly back to, to England. It kind of lost its namesake and became the Slow Well or something. That's a bad joke. <laughs> so on the Mayflower, there were 102 passengers. Only 41 of them were separatists. The others were merchants that were going to the New World. They were people that were going to try to uh, buy land and become landowners there in the New World. Um, some of them were crew. But these 41 separatists from Scrooby that had left England 12 years before were first named pilgrims with a small p by William Bradford, who was a teenager in Leiden and had made the, the voyage with them on the Mayflower. He later on goes on to become governor of Plymouth Colony. Now, rough seas and a questionable seamanship, they don't land in Virginia. So they don't, this contract that they have with the Virginia Trading Company is now, what do we do? We're not in Virginia. We're not, we can't live under their laws. We don't have to follow their rules. So what do we do? So as they're sitting, they, they first arrive in a harbor up on the eastern tip of Cape Cod. If you know anything about Cape Cod, it looks like a kind of a big horseshoe. And up on the far eastern tip of it is Provincetown. And that's where they were first anchored. And before they could send out, or before they did send out any kind of a scouting party to find out what was out there, they decided to draw up the Mayflower Compact. Now, the Mayflower Compact was just a, a very short document, 
one page with signatures on the second page, but it created the laws for these Mayflower pilgrims or these Mayflower separatists. It covered both the separatists and everyone else that was there that was going to be part of this new colony. It was a sort document. And that document, number one, is established that the colonists would remain loyal subjects to King James uh, despite their need for self-governance. It established that the colonists would create and enact laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices for the good of the colony and that they would abide by those laws. The colonists would create one society and work together to further it. And then finally, the most important one, at least to the separatists, was that the colonists would live in accordance with the Christian faith. Now, not everyone on that boat was a Christian. Not everyone on the boat was a separatist. But everyone agreed through this compact that in order to be able to run this colony and keep the peace, that they would live in accordance with the Christian faith. So they sent out their scouting parties to find a good location for where they could set up this colony. And on December 10th of 2018, 2018, who did that? That's what it says here. That's why I'm reading it. 1620. <laughs> During one of the many scouting trips, they find a small harbor on the western side of Cape Cod. So they go from the far eastern tip down around to the western side. That small harbor, there's an Indian village that had been abandoned. That, on the map that they had, is listed as Plymouth. P-L-I-M-O-U-T-H, Plymouth. Now, it's just a coincidence that they sailed from Plymouth in England and they arrive in Plymouth in America, right? It's just a coincidence. But at this abandoned village, they decide this is where we can set up our colony. So that's what they do. They land at Plymouth. Now, I think most of you know and maybe some of you even remember what came next? Come on, that was funny, wasn't it? Some of you remember? Forget it. <laughs> so what came next? What came next was a bad winter, right? It was in what has been known during a time of what's been called the mini ice age. And it was hard. Lots of snow, lots of ice, freezing cold. Many, many, many of the separatists and those original 102, they lost half of the people during that first winter. After that first winter, the Indians come back and they are friendly. They kind of have a compact between them and they're there, they help the, the colonists and they helped them. To, that's how we get our first Thanksgiving was because they were showing how to grow corn and how to, to, to live off the land, which was completely foreign to get these guys. Yes, they were farmers, but they're in a new, whole new world with a whole new set of circumstances. So... Why do I tell you about the, the pilgrims and the Puritans? Well, because I want you to understand that there is a, a difference between them. Puritans, because they believed that they could reform the Church of England from within, the colony that they established in the Massachusetts Bay Colony was a run by the church. If you lived in that Massachusetts Bay Colony, you were required to be a member of that church, the Church of England. You could not serve in local government. You could not be a leader if you were not a member of the Church of England. You could not receive communion 
if you are not a member of the Church of England. And it got to the point where they, these Puritans, ran everybody else out of the colony. The Catholics, the Quakers, and the other non-Protestants that were non-Puritans that were there trying to settle in that area. Because you must be a member of the Church of England if you're going to live in our colony. Now the pilgrims, on the other hand, were a congregationist. They were congregationalist. Um, there, in their colony, you didn't need to be a member of the church to be a local government. How many of you know the story of Miles Standish? Right? He was probably the, one of the most prominent pilgrims. He was not a member of the church of England. He was not a member of any church. In fact, nobody's really sure what faith, if any, he had. But yet he, came, he went on to become a, a, a major leader in that pilgrim colony there at Plymouth. Uh, anyone could come and live in that colony. It didn't matter if you were part of their church or not. They, they lived amongst the natives, the Native Americans that were there. And they came and went from the colony without any restrictions. And the local church body for the pilgrims was made up of independent congregations that had control over what it was that that congregation was going to teach and what that congregation was going to, to preach. So you see the difference between the Puritans and the pilgrims or the separatists was that they wanted to be free from that hierarchy of the Church of England. And they wanted to be able to worship and learn and have church in the way that they believed that the Bible taught them to. So now, let's forward, jump forward about 150 years. And this distinction between Puritans and pilgrims is going to become very important. And we all know that Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4, 1776. We just had that celebration last weekend. And it solidified our independence from England and got us out from underneath England's rule and their tyranny and their persecution. In that time, phrases like taxation without representation and give me liberty or give me death were they being championed by the colonists. But perhaps the most significant part of this declaration of independence I think that went two slides. Was there we go. The statement We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, unalienable rights. There are rights that are, according to the Webster Dictionary, are not capable of being taken away or denied. Here, in this Declaration of Independence, the important part is that it were endowed by their Creator. Because God sanctioned these rights, because these rights came to the, to the colonists and to us from our Creator, those rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, cannot be taken away. So anyway, the colonists go on and they draft a constitution. 
was drafted during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia that lasted from May to September of 1787. They ratified the Constitution in 1788. That document became the governing document of the United States of America. It still is the governing document of this country today. But one thing we don't find in the Constitution is much mention of religion. And so there was a Virginian statesman who was a future president named James Madison who set about to fix that. And so James Madison, with the help of others, drew up 12 amendments that they were going to propose as amendments to the Constitution. They circulated it to all, amongst the states. Ten of the 12, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but only 10 of the 12 were ratified. And that ratification came on December the 15th of 1791. And those first, attendment, uh, first 10 amendments would become later known as the Bill of Rights. Obviously, it's still known as the Bill of Rights today. So I want to just briefly look at the first one of those 10 amendments, the very first part of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This simple phrase meant to prohibit the government from establishing a state church was a direct attack against the Church of England that was favored by the Puritan colonies. And it was also set up to, to keep the government from favoring one religion over another. It also ushered in Thomas Jefferson's famous concept of the separation of church and state. The separation of church and state is a pilgrim or a separatist concept. That the church as a body of believers, should be separate and apart from the state government. And the state government should have no rule or say so over those believers. Now, ironically, Thomas Jefferson was raised in an Anglic Anglican household. Think Puritan. Okay. In his later life, he was believed and wrote frequently on the idea that the state and the church must be kept separate. Think Pilgrim. Okay? So that's why it becomes important to understand where that separation comes from and what the difference is. Now, notice that there's nothing in the Bill of Rights identifying the freedom of religion as an unalienable right. That's because here, the freedom of religion is a right that's given to us by the government through the U.S. Constitution. And of course, we all know, what the government giveth, the government can take it away. Right? You with me? I think that's probably actually the 11th commandment. I think we can all agree that James Madison... Thomas Jefferson and the rest of the forefathers got it right when they drafted this Bill of Rights. The government has no business establishing its own religion or prohibiting us from practicing our religion as we see fit. But for today, we're going to leave it there and we're going to look at another application regarding the freedom of religion. Because we could probably spend every Sunday for the next 20 years talking about this Bill of Rights and the rights that have been given and the rights that have been taken away and how those rights have been changed or altered over time, how they evolve. Because if it's given by the government, it can be changed by the government. It can be taken away by the government. 
So let's move on then to our, the second part of our message. We'll try to wrap this up pretty quickly. Uh, turn to chapter 17 of the book of Acts. And I'm going to read through this. It's, it, it's a long passage, but I think it's important to hear it. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollon, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Cyrus, Silas. But the Jews were not persuaded. Becoming envious, they took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come down here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So let's stop here a minute. And just look at what's what's kind of going on here. Paul goes into the synagogue and preaches Jesus. People were saved. But some of the people, the ones who were not saved, were mad at Paul. And after they left the synagogue, they went out and they gathered a mob. And they started a riot. And the mob ends up over at Jason's house looking to retrieve Paul so that they can hold him accountable. Are you with me so far? You see what's going on? When Paul's not there, they take Jason, some of the other captives, and they drag them through the city to the city rulers where they then accuse them of heresy or whatever else, not uh, of, of teaching another king besides Caesar. Well, they didn't get Paul. So what do they do? They basically take bail money from Jason and the others, and they kick them loose. Now, imagine that you're, at this point, imagine you're Paul. Aren't you thinking, man, that was a close one. I think I'll just kind of quietly go back home. Maybe I'll write a book. Maybe I'll teach a little bit. But this, this teaching in the synagogue and having people coming after me, it's not my cup of tea. I know if I were in that situation, it would be a struggle for me to go on. And I'm not sure that I would have chosen that option. But of course we know Paul did go on. In verse 10 it says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. Well, that's good. In that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, again, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Here we go again. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. 
but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now this was another narrow escape for Paul. So do you think Paul was experiencing much in the way of freedom of a religion at that time? Seems that when he preached the word, there were those who were offended by it. And those who were offended by it tried to lay siege to him, to keep him from teaching and preaching that word. But fortunately, by the grace of God, Paul escaped each time. Now, we know that that's not always the case because later on, Paul gets imprisoned and he dies in prison. So, in the meantime, though, we've got Paul who's now just escaped two separate mobs who were there to take hold of him and throw him in jail or do what they would. So now in verse 16, it says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Paul was teaching the word. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to proclaim to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new things. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Oropagus and said, Men of Athens, <laughs> I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, I don't know about you, but I think Paul maybe missed his calling. He probably should have been a lawyer, because that's one heck of an argument. It goes on to say, Nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said for we also for we are also his offspring therefore since we are the offspring of God we ought not to think that the divine nature is like silver or gold or stone something shaped by art and man's devising truly these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. 
So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius, the Arapagite, <laughs> a woman named Marius, and others with them. Now, I know this has been a lot of scripture to, to digest, but when I read this the first time, I was just blown away by this passage, and I just felt it was too important to leave anything out. So I was struck by the fact that here we are, over 2,000 years later, 229 years since the Bill of Rights was ratified, giving us all this freedom of religion. And unfortunately, I don't see that we've made any progress. If Paul had relied upon the freedom of religion given to him by government or by man, he may have just called it quits after the first couple of times. Because we know that that right to freedom of religion created for us by the government can just as easily be taken away. But Paul was operating on a completely different plane of religious freedom. For him, it was not the right of religious freedom. It was the gift of religious freedom. It was a gift that was given to him by God. Turn with me now over to chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11 because Paul then gets a vision. And he says, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. You see, Paul, like every one of us, got this gift of freedom of a religion. The Lord told him, speak out, Paul. Don't be afraid and don't be silent. He commanded it. And then this is the good part. The Lord essentially told Paul, remember this? And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Man. This message that the Lord spoke to Paul through a vision is equally appropriate for us today. Do not be afraid. But speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you. You see, those of us who have accepted that free gift of God's Son and have realized His salvation must also accept the responsibility to not keep silent, but to exercise every opportunity that we are given, every opportunity that we are presented with to Give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. Because later, Paul prophesies in Acts chapter 20 about what we as Christians can expect even though we have been given a right to the freedom of religion. So let's turn a couple more pages over to Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, 
I command you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That's Paul's word for us today. That's the, what I want you to take from here today when you walk out that door. Yes, we have the right to freedom of religion that was given to us by our government. And we have the duty to protect that right. But even if that right withers, even if that right slowly is being taken away, the gift of the freedom to exercise our religion within ourselves, that gift that we have to celebrate Jesus and to worship Jesus in our hearts, even if sometimes it, be, it comes with circumstances, is a gift that is unalienable. It's given by God, that gift, that freedom of religion can never be taken away. And so now, brothers and sisters, as Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Let's pray.